Good morning, everybody. Good We're morning. A um, little roll call to see who's available. So, it was that you, Adam? Yes. Okay, and Derek, are you on? Great, 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 great. How about John Flandry? Hey, Patty, I'm here. This is Derek. Sorry for being late. That's okay. You're good, Derek. Thank you. John? Patrick, are you on? I sure am, Patty. Good morning. Good morning. Do you, did you hear anything from John? He told me that he was going to be traveling. He felt he'd be part of the meeting, but in case he had oh, a reception, so I'll, I'll make sure to be here the whole meeting. So, Hey, great. Thank you so much. Patty, can you hear me now? Oh, we do hear you. Thank Patty. you. All right. I, I was having trouble with my phone. Thank you. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I think we've got everybody here, Kathy. Okay. Good morning. We will begin our Antelope Valley Water Master Board regular meeting. We will call the meeting to order and roll call vote, please. Okay. Director Ariki? Here. Director Chisholm? Here. Director Calandri? Here. Director Urasic? Here. Director McLaren? Here. Okay. With that, we'll move to the adoption of the agenda. Do we have a motion? Mrs. So Derek, I'll make that motion. John will second. Okay. <coughs> Do we have any public comment? Hearing no public comment, may we have a presentation? All right. Thank you. Uh, so this is Peter Thompson, and I'll be walking through the first portion of this presentation, and Matt is going to jump in and help me with the AVEX side. But the advisory committee and, and the board had asked for a presentation on state water project supplies. So this is just a brief overview and kind of give some perspective on why the state water uh, contractors in the valley haven't been as concerned about uh, replacement water assessments uh, in, in the early foundation of this water master. So to start off, um, each agency, AVEC, Palmdale Water District, and Little Rock Creek Irrigation District have a contracted table A amount with DWR. And you can see those up there. Uh, AVEC has close to 145,000 acre feet uh, contracted. DWD, 21,000. And Little Rock, a little over 2,000. Now, we don't receive that every single year. What we do is we get a allocation from DWR that uh, is a percentage of that. And I, like in 2021, that percentage was 5%. But that can vary from year to year. Um, DWR has, uh, did recently do, in 2019, a long-term uh, delivery capability report that estimated how much supply, on average, uh, contractors could expect to receive from the state water project. And uh, and that, that means, and right now, they're estimating that on an average year, around the 2020 timeframe, contractors could expect to receive a 58% allocation. And just to give a little perspective on that, for, for AVEC, that would be close to 84,000 acre feet. And for Palmdale, it would be close to 12,000 acre feet. And, and even with the, um, Palmdale also has other leases. So with those leases, for them, it'd be closer to 18,000. Now, that projection of 58% on average does trend down to 52% by 2040. And I know it can be hard when we're in the middle of a drought to look at that and go, oh, how, like, or is that realistic? But I do want to emphasize that when DWR put this together, they're looking, they're looking at the regulatory restrictions that are on the project um, for, for 
endangered species. They're also looking at climate change as a factor, and we're pretty conservative on that. So this is a conservative estimate of what the next 20 years would look like on the state water project with that 58 to 52% average. All right, next slide, please. And here we, got a, we have a table that shows the different allocations um, going back uh, quite some time. And you can see how variable it is. Um, and we definitely hit like a, a, a trough and a drought period. And we're, we're, we're in a new one right now. But just to give you an example of how that bounces around, you, know, you have highs of um, I believe up to 85% in recent times. And uh, during those big peaks, uh, both Palmdale Water District and AVEC actively engage in transfers and exchanges to, to invest that excess supply that we can't even take into the valley because it's so much excess water at that point. Uh, so, and, and, you know, in the meantime, you have AVEC has developed banking to help with bring in that excess, some of that excess supply and Palmdale's working towards that. So we'll, we'll be able to balance out that variability in supply through banking. Um, all right. So next slide. I think at this slide, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Matt to give a perspective on supply and demand. Right. Thank you, Pete. Good morning. This is Matt. Uh, so this slide is um, right out of AVAC's recently adopted urban water management plan that the board adopted the uh, last couple months. And it's a, a long-term planning projection to manage the uh, water supply that's available to AVAC. So you can see down at the bottom, this covers the period of 2025 through 2045. And the blue bar is the long-term average of the AVAX Table A or State Water Project Supply that Pete just spoke about. This is takes into account that 58% reliability in 2025. That makes up the 81,840 acre feet of Table A. And then you add uh, the groundwater supplies available to AVAC, uh, imported water return flows to AVAC, and some non-state water project. So our total water supply portfolio is just under 88,000 acre feet per year on the long-term average. And then looking out in the future, uh, this planning document and graph takes into account the reliability dipping down from 58% to 58% or 52% that uh, Pete spoke about. So in 2045, our average water annual water supply is in the 81,000 acre feet range. And then if you, on the demand side of what our customers purchase from AVAC for import water supplies, uh, you can see currently it's about 44,000 acre feet per year. And we look at, um, we take various planning documents such as SCAG and growth projections from both LA County and Kern County within our service area. And based on those projections, we're estimating that our annual demand from our customers will go up to 57,590 acre feet in 2045. So this just kind of emphasizes what Pete spoke about the importance of uh, banking here in the Valley for agencies like AVAC is on average year, our supplies exceed our demand. So we, we have to ensure that we have adequate banking capacity, storage capacity, as well as uh, recovery capacity through the wells to uh, take advantage of the, the water when it's available to uh, store locally. So any questions from the board on this slide? Thank you. Hey, Matt, where, where the extraction capacity, uh, where, where is AVEC on that? So where, like where are we at as far as current capacity, capacity. annual capacity? Right. 
So we're in the 20 to 25,000 acre feet per year range of our current groundwater recovery capacity. We we'll see. What about the banking capacity? I actually have a slide. Okay. I'll wait on that now. You want to look at that? We could jump ahead to that. Yeah. Um, take your time. You know, go do it how, how you see. Okay. Well, we'll let Pete cover the next slide then. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this also comes from a presentation on our urban water management, a recently adopted urban water management plan for Palmdale Water District. So it shows a nice little uh, mix of Palmdale Water District supplies, and it includes recycled water, it includes um, an augmentation project, and our leases of water with the State Water Project. Uh, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the demand line, a black line with the, uh, with the values above it. We project in 2025 to have an annual demand of close to 20,000 acre feet a year, and that'll move up to close to 20, around 24,000 acre, 25,000 acre feet by 2040. Uh, we're actively developing those supplies to make sure that we, we have that buffer on those average years so that we can store water and have it available for, this, for dry years. And uh, we're, we're confident that we, we have water supply, enough excess water supply that we can, we can support replacement water obligations within our service area uh, moving forward. So happy to answer any questions you might have on this slide. And, um, and Peter, this is Adam. Did you use the same growth projections as AVEC did, meaning SCADs and? Uh, we utilized uh, DWR's population tool. Uh, mm -hmm. that, was, that was what DVR was recommending to us. So it may not be the exact same, but. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And do you remember what growth rate that assumes on average? I, I I apologize, Adam. I don't remember. No, no, no worry. No worry. You know, I was just curious because, you know, the, the period that I experienced in the AV, they kind of go up and down. It goes from really fast growth to nothing at all for years and years and years. I was just wondering what, if you normalize that over time, what it would look like, 3 4% or, or more. Uh, but that's fine. Next slide, Angel. Uh, May, could you go one more? Sorry. Um, let's see. Go, go one more. I'm looking for the one to answer uh, Adam's question. Maybe one more. Yeah. Sorry about this. There we go. Mm -hmm. This is perfect. Um, so, taking into account the the growth and cool. demand projections within the AVEX service area. In our urban water management plan, whoops, there we go. Um, it takes into account what the banking capacity uh, target storage <clears throat> volumes are. So as you can see, in, uh, currently the volume of water we would like to have banked locally to go through those periods of low or dry uh, weather conditions, uh, low allocations through the state water project we'd like to have 72,638 acre feet of uh, stored imported water locally. And we currently have exceeded that, that target for AVAC. So the AVAC board and agency have done a great job in developing the, the banking projects and currently are meeting that long-term goal of 72,000 acre feet. And then you can see on the green line, that's showing what the target recovery capacity is needed to get through the, those same periods of dry or low allocation years. And as, as you can imagine, as growth uh, and demand increases, the storage capacity needs to increase as well. So looking out to, for instance, 2045, our target capacity about, is about 125,000 acre feet of mm -hmm. imported stored water available. and. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and then the you can see the correlating recovery capacity increases as well to about 42,000 acre feet per year. So hopefully that answers your question, Director. It, 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 do, it does. It does. And the when the the green line, the target uh, production capacity, that's the well capacity that we like as an example right now. AVEC has a extraction capacity of 24,000. Yeah, acre. correct. In that 20, 25,000 acre feet per year range. Okay. And that um, the, the, uh, oh, you don't have the demand here. You, you said this is to meet or to make up for any uh, reduction in, in the delivery of the state water project water. Does this assume a critical dry year or does it assume consecutive, three consecutive it, dry years or how? This assumes multiple dry years. It, it assumes five thirty consecutive, yeah, five percent, uh, or not five percent, five consecutive below average years. So we've modeled um, the previous uh, drought period, which had five consecutive mm -hmm. years of uh, low allocation, and this this scenario models that same period. Okay. All right. Okay. And then the same question that I asked uh, Peter, just out of curiosity, the SCAGS projections that you referred to, uh, is that like a 4%, 3% um, average long-term yeah. growth? Yeah, we use the SCAG numbers um, for LA County and then can't recall what the current county uh, equivalent is, but they have a similar process. And it's in that 3% range, annual growth range. Okay. Thank you. And that, that is kind of in line with historical growth rate, right? Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. And I believe that's kind of all we had today, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's all we have to show this morning. Uh, you have to answer any hey, more questions. Which number did it just say I was calling from? Yeah, I don't know. It just said you, but I have your work number in there, too. Chad, uh, you're... Uh, you're unmuted. All right. Kathy, we're ready to move on. Okay, thank you for that presentation. We will go to number six, which is the consent agenda. A is payment of bills through October 21st, 2021. B is the treasurer's report for the month ending September 30th, 2021. C is the accounts receivable aging summary as of September 30th, 2021. And E is minutes of regular meetings, September 22nd, 2021. Do I have a motion for the consent agenda? This is Adam. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Uh, uh, Director Jurassic and myself met with the staff uh, on Monday and we went over the bill and we discussed it. Uh, this is just for the information of the remaining board members uh, and uh, we're, we're good with the uh, approval of the consent items. So I move that we approve the consent item agenda, uh, agenda items. Okay. Do I have this a Derek, I'll second it. Thank you. Sorry there, Captain. Do we have any public comment? Okay, hearing no public comment. May I have a roll call vote, please? Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Calandri? Yes. Director Urasek? Yes. Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. We will go on to number seven, the advisory committee report. And Chair Chafin <coughs> will do that report. <coughs> Somebody talking? I don't hear anything. Okay. 
I don't think he is is on the call. James? Yes, James isn't on the call. So in your board packet on page 23 is a written report from uh, James Chasen, the advisory committee chair. And uh, we'd be healthy, happy to help out with any questions you have on the, the memo. What page is that? Uh, it begins on page 23 of your board packet. No question for me. Okay. Okay, if we have no questions on that, we could go to the committee reports for the administrative committee. So good morning, this Matt. Uh, staff met with the administrative committee of directors uh, Ricky and Erostic earlier this week went through various items on the agenda this morning. Um, we also touched on the upcoming uh, amendment that's on the agenda today with uh, Todd Groundwater, as well as the administrative budget for calendar year 2022. And then we also presented uh, our proposed process for dealing with um, oh, what we call it, non-compliance or help me out with the term, Angel. With the enforcement. Enforcement, issues. thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with the enforcement. So it seemed like the, the community was happy with the process that staff and legal counsel and the uh, water minister engineer laid out. And we felt a nice um, table to kind of track where the various parties that are not or that are out of uh, compliance or need some enforcement, arm twisting. Uh, so they're happy with that. And I think going forward, we're going to tackle those in closed session with the board and legal counsel. And that's uh, that's all I have to report unless uh, Ariki or Jurassic would like to add anything. No, I think you covered it well. All right. Okay. And we will go to item number nine, which is consideration and possible, possible action on certifying the delinquent assessment list. Good morning, Ms. Matt. Uh, so as you know, this item was tabled from the last board meeting uh, due to, to some in last minute inquiries that we received. But uh, we have verified that the, the list is accurate um, no changes have been made as and it, staff is recommending that the board certify the 2021 delinquent assessment list as presented. Mm -hmm. Just for, for the purpose of clarification, Matt, what does that mean, you know, when, when the board certified this list? So this is right out of the, uh, the judgment as well as the rules and regs. There's a statement in there that uh, prior to a certain time frame, I think it was September 15th, um, the board shall certify and file the delinquent list of all past due assessments. Okay. So it's, it's more of a procedural thing just to make sure that we are making public and making the board aware of all past due assessments. Got it. And this is Craig Parton, uh, Director Ricky. That, that's <laughs> correct. It's section 18.5.2 or point excuse me is 18.4.12 of the judgment talks about it being done annually okay so this is just in compliance okay it doesn't go to court or anything no okay. thank you do i have a motion to certify the delinquent assessment list John, I move, I move to uh, to approve and certify the list and file. And this right. is Adam, I second it. 
Thank you. Do we have any public comment on that item? Hearing none, we will go to a roll call vote. Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Calandri? Yes. Director Urosic? Yes. Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. We will go to item number 10, which is consideration and possible action to approve the revised application form. Good morning, this is Kate White from Todd Groundwater. I can take this one. We would like to add um, wording to three well application forms to include a two year requirement for well completion and meter installation. And similar wording would appear on three applications, which are the new production application, the replacement well application, and the new point of extraction um, well application. The new wording is shown in red um, on the forms that start on page 34 of the packet. And the wording would be the same for all three forms. And at the top of the form, um, we'd include a box for administrative staff to add the date the application was approved and the date the application expires, which would be two years from approval. And the second page of the application would include a sentence that states in the signature portion of the application, um, and actually I'll just read that sentence. I understand that I have two years from approval to install the well and provide the water master with a well completion report and have a water master approved meter installed on the well and that my application will be revoked if the water master does not receive this information within two years from approval. So the same text would um, be added to um, all three forms. And um, so I also want to add um, that this deadline is not part of the current rules and regulations and that we probably should do an amendment um, to the rules and regulations to include this requirement um, if everyone feels that this is uh, something that they want. Mm -hmm. so, so are there any questions, discussion on this? Yeah, this is Adam, Kate. I mean, I Adam? understand, I think I understand the logic behind it. Could you confirm my understanding? Um, you know, currently, you know, we've approved applications and then these, uh, the wells haven't been installed. And um, we would like some kind of mechanism to um, have the applicant realize that they have two years to do this or else their application will be revoked, as opposed to it just kind of sitting there for a while and things can change five years from now. Um, and so we want to give a deadline to that. Okay. And the reason we don't want an open-ended application is, I understand you said things can change, but can you be a bit more specific? Well, um, I think, I think that Adam, we, um, Adam, I help it. I think this helps us with enforcement. We know then when the people have metered, they know they need to feature by a certain time. And I think it just helps us a lot more with the enforcement of our application. Okay. Thanks, Patty. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, this is Craig. I, I just wanted to confirm with Patty's comments. I, my recollection of the discussion in the past was there needed to be some kind of uh, drop dead date for the installation of the well and compliance um, with, with the application. And that this gave staff the opportunity to track these situations specifically and act if uh, there's no well installation information uh, acquired <laughs> and it also gets them to put their meter on in a timely manner as well yeah this is a Kate, uh, 
this director Chisholm, I, I, I wanted to uh, see if uh, in um, the application process, if there's uh, a way to extend it. Um, I could see a, a condition where, you know, maybe there's an issue with uh, construction loan or the price of lumber or some some other uh, scenario where someone just for 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 practical reasons just wasn't able to uh, get the project complete. You know, as long as there's, uh, I, I just think the language should should indicate that there's a um, uh, that they can extend it or come back to the board with a reason to extend it a year or whatever it might be, uh, to be, just so that there's some documentation. I understand the enforcement action and what you're trying to do to not have these open-ended uh, type of items. But on the other hand, I think it's important that we just don't drop them and then have to have come back and do the whole, uh, the whole thing all over again in two years. So. Yeah, Dwayne, that's a good idea. Yeah, this is Director Calandria. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I, I'm not so sure I want to go with, with a year extension, but I, I would definitely be on board for a six month extension if 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 it was warranted. And then we just got to have some kind of a mechanism that we can either approve the extension or deny the extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And I think maybe when we draft up text for the rules and regulations, we can include something like that for people's review. And it would be a one-time six-month extension, right? Um, yeah, I think we should. We can think about how that would be worded. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to make the extension um, a way around putting a time frame to this process. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. people are kind of clever, and they're going to ask for an extension for six months, another six months, another six months. So we're going to say whether a one-time or a two-time, whatever we agree to. Uh, I I happen to agree with that idea because sometimes the well is not completed and maybe they're in the middle of drilling it or they're in the middle of acquiring a meter. So it's okay to give a six-month extension as long as it's uh, warranted. Uh, but I think it should be a one-time extension. Adam, uh, this is John. Along with that, along with that thought, um, um, I think if they haven't even started the well in the first two-year period, it would be very, very remote for us to give them an extension. I think they almost have to be in the process before they get an extension. So I think the board needs to consider that verbiage as well. I I agree with that. I agree with that because you don't just uh, give an extension for the sake of an extension. It, there needs to be a progress. Like a good right, faith exactly. effort, as long as exactly. you put in a good faith effort. Exactly. This is Derek. Just a question for Craig. I mean, anything with adding that verbiage that would, although we change it in our rules and regs, that would conflict with the judgment? Have you reviewed that? No, I don't think that there's a conflict. Uh, I certainly will in the, in the interim before we submit it as a potential for public comment on uh, amending the rules and regs. Nothing comes directly to mind, uh, Director Yersa, that, that it conflicts with. In fact, I think it helps fulfill the, the purpose of the judgment. I like that answer, the end of that answer very well, and agree. Okay, we'll move on to that. I, do I have a motion? to approve these revised application forms. And it I, sounds like the amend, amendment is gonna come with the rules and regulations, if I'm understanding that correctly. I, but we need to revise the language to reflect the extensions and the limitation on the extensions. I, I, I will make the motion provided we have specific uh, addition, deletion, deletion to the proposed language. You know, this is going to come yeah. as an amendment to the rules and regs anyway. I would suggest we not, that the board not take action on it until it has actual language. I think that we're clear on what the board is looking for, but I think a resolution at this point would be. Um, to wait. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. I, I would re- I would recommend that we wait till we have a resolution that includes rules and regs change, and we yeah. review that, discuss it along with the application change. Okay, so we are um, deciding to table this motion. Do we need to have a vote on that? Nope. Okay, then we are tabling that at this time. We will go to number 11, consideration and possible action reboard authority to adopt policy position on cannabis. That is a memorandum reboard authority to adopt policy position on cannabis. Yes, so this, this is a matter that's been in the board packet uh, last month and this month. Uh, for discussion. A brief memo on it is at page 43 of your packet. Was in response to public comment and advisory committee input um, suggesting that the board take a formal position in a letter to the Board of Supervisors um, officially opposing the legalization of commercial cannabis in the basin. Um, and we've looked at it and think that that taking a policy position of approval or disapproval of a particular use is not within the four corners of the judgment. Doesn't mean the board can't uh, weigh in on water theft and request uh, sheriff resources and the theft of water, but that I think is a separate issue from taking a position in that the judgment allows us to to uh, take a policy position that uh, against the legalization of cannabis or or the the uh, legalization of it one way or the other. So the memo is um, there for those purposes. Um, the board can either comment or have us take it back for further consideration. Uh, or by voice vote, there's no resolution on it. A voice vote uh, would be that the board does not wish to express a policy position on cannabis uh, or just um, let the, uh, the memo stand as it is with no action by the board. So happy to answer any questions. And the advisory committee had disparate views on this. Um, there seems to be a confusion that we're saying that the board can't speak out against the theft of water, which it can, obviously. But we're looking at the specific issue of whether the board has the authority under the judgment to weigh in on a policy question um, that approves or disapproves a particular use, and in this case, uh, the use, the commercial use of cannabis. <laughs> I, uh, this is Adam. I completely agree with what you're saying, Craig. Right? I think we already have in the judgment and in our rules and regulations authority to deal with water theft and illegal uh, pumping. Yeah. So we can we can deal with that now. We don't need any policies or positions on that or anything. Am I correct? You're correct. And, and if the board wanted to reach out to another body that has enforcement authority in an area that relates to theft of water, it could do so. Sure. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Craig, this is uh, Calandria. As a point of clarification, do you know what the uh, county supervisor's position was on this, what they, what they did? I'm not aware of what they did in relation to to the, you mean what what they did in relation to <laughs> the, this cannabis uh, what position they took and, uh, against it for it or does anybody on the board can they fill me in on what the, the county supervisor I, position was on this th- this is Adam um, I you know I don't know if if any of the supervisor staff from the AV office is on the call here if they are. Uh, there probably would be the most appropriate staff to speak to this issue. 
Uh, now I did with uh, uh, I think Director Paris for sure was leading the effort, but I don't know if there were any other directors. We met, I want to say, two, three months ago on this issue, and the supervisor's office was represented. Uh, uh, so some of the senator's offices, both at the state and the federal level, were, were represented at that meeting. And, of course, the two cities, city of Lancaster, city of Palmdale, and AVEC. Uh, and we discussed extensively uh, this issue and action items and the new reinforcement issue and all that. Uh, and I think, if I may, uh, Director Clandry, uh, recommend that you speak with... Uh, the supervisor's office, uh, Donna Tremier, uh, that would be the best uh, way for you to get that information from her. But I know there has been a lot of effort from the supervisor's office on this issue and the sheriff and the two cities as well. Mm. All right, thank you, Adam. Hey, John? Yes. John, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. John, this is Kyle. Uh, I agree with Mr. Parton who said that you could reach out to another authority that might help enforce this water theft. And that's, that was my suggestion to write to the supervisors to applaud them in awarding five million to the sheriff's department and ask them to continue to fully fund the sheriff's department to fight this water theft that is, is uh, causing chaos. And the, uh, the Palmdale Water District wrote a letter to the supervisors asking them not only to do that, but to not lift the ban because they thought it would be more chaotic. And I applaud the Palmdale Water District for doing that. They did the right thing. And I would like to see the water master do the same. Okay, well put, Galen, thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I personally don't have any objections with that approach. Is, is that something, Craig, that uh, we could do just uh, uh, supporting the actions that other people have taken towards the, the water theft issue? If it's limited to the issue of water theft and not a comment on whether the board should legalize or not legalize a particular use of water. Uh, and I understand that. So I, I guess I would be I would be in favor of, of uh, encouraging a letter of some sort uh, just just in regards to the water theft issue about plotting the, the, the supervisors for what they did and, and uh, just letting people know that this is that we are concerned about it as, as a water master board on the theft issue one other point John if you can hear me yeah. I uh, I'm not trying to uh, make a point about legalization or not marijuana is legal in the state of california there is a ban right now in la county unincorporated la county and the reason we'd like to keep that ban in place is because we have such a problem right now uh with the illegal theft of water and and if you lift that ban it's going to get worse the voters of california were promised that if you legalize and regulate marijuana, the black market will go away. Well, Antelope Valley is Exhibit A that that didn't happen. Well, I, I okay, to, to address you one-on-one, um, -on -one, Galen, I, I, um, I know I, I agree with the position that the board could, could encourage the uh, deterrent of the water healing situation, but I also understand Craig's position that we cannot take a, a position on the cannabis. So that's, as you, as, as you have explained it, I can support that. So, but it's up to the board to see, give, give us some input on that. Only two people. I agree we should speak out about the theft. Does anyone else have any, any, um, comments on that and are we asking for Craig to come back with something on the theft? 
Yeah, this is Director Chisholm. I, I, I concur with the theft issue, and, and I think it might be uh, appropriate to uh, give uh, Craig an opportunity to draft a letter um, working within the guidelines uh, that uh, he's established to address the theft issue and be able to uh, um, use what he can from the Palmdale letter and others to incorporate a letter from the agency that uh, meets our meets our our uh, limited abilities to comment on the on uh, uh, cannabis issues. So the other ones that haven't weighed in, are you? Who who okay is this letter going to go to? I'm uh, I'm assuming that it would be going to the county board of supervisors. Yes. So I'm not hearing any of Yeah, I'm sorry. I would like to comment, this is Derek. I, I, you know, okay. I do support about the theft. I, I want to make sure to um, Adam's question, we're sending it to the right people and the people that matter and are the ones funding this effort to, you know, enforce um you know the illegal usage, so um, I, I'm 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 a little perplexed to who that is, and making sure that we know, you know, and, and get input from from both staff and um, council as well as the public of who we should be sending that letter to. Um, make sure we are doing it to the right place. Places. So we will ask Craig to also. Um, check into the proper places that the, the letter or letters need to be addressed. So they are going to the appropriate. Yeah, let me kind of ask, uh, I want to ask, we need to be a little bit careful about, in light of what, uh, what Craig said, uh, we, you know, we want to make sure that improper pumping and or purchase, well, I don't know about purchase, if it's, if, as long as we know it's reported, we don't really care if somebody sells water. We're not enforcing cannabis. What we're enforcing is uh, the legal use of the water supply source in the AV. And we have a broad authority to do that, uh, whether it's illegal drilling, we can go and, and actually take enforcement action. I don't know how we do that, but I think we we can take into court and and uh, have Judge Turner issues some sort of an injunction against the use of the well. It's, it's being illegally drilled. I and to me, a letter sent to any political body or an, it has to be sent to a political body is again, it puts the board in a, in a different uh, path with just an arm of the court. So I, I would like for Craig, you know, to opine on that if you could, Craig. I mean, this is how I see the world. I, we don't want to stay away from politics. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to walk the careful line between the interest that uh, the other board members expressed and the public has expressed to weigh in that we appreciate the support that's being given to control the illegal theft of water within the jurisdiction of the water master. Though the water master has its own authority, it obviously is greatly helped by financial and resource assistance. Like, uh, or a political body such as the Board of Supervisors. Um, I'm not sure who the letter would go to yet either, but I can suggest I do a draft and we discuss it at the December, next uh, December special meeting. Okay, that's fine. Now, did the Retail Water Agency write letters of this nature? Does anybody know? Because those are, those are the entities that are mostly impacted from water theft. I know LA County Water Works District uh, was greatly impacted by the water theft. Yeah. 
Uh, and I heard at one point that Plumden Water District, maybe not Plumden Water District, but definitely Little Rock Irrigation Water District was impacted as well. So those agency maybe uh, are more appropriate to write letters uh, pertaining to this type of water thing. And I was wondering if they even did that. Adam, this is Chad. We we also wrote a letter along with Palmdale. Oh, okay. So Palmdale did and you guys did? Yes. Okay. Who did you send the letter to, Chad? Uh, Board of Supervisors. And then we sent a separate one over to Kathy also. Or Catherine. Okay. Okay, so we are all agreement that... Um, Mr. Parton is going to write something up and, and bring it to us at a future meeting. Right, and explore explore who to send the letter to. I thought I heard that, uh, Craig, or no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Will do. Thank you. Okay, then we will go on to number 12, which is consideration and possible action on transfer application and we will start with a the Craig and Marta Van Dam to White Fence Farms Mutual Water Company 3. Good morning this is Kate White with Todd Groundwater and um, there are four transfer applications on the agenda for approval today. The advisory committee had some general questions that are on page 25 of the packet that I'd like to address before um, discussing each transfer application because their questions are kind of general in nature. And um, the first question is, um, are transfer applications being treated consistently with regard to which applicants are required to purchase one acre feet of production <coughs> rights to become an exhibit or party in order to approve the transfer and which are not? I think if I understand the question um, correctly, that I believe um, that we have been consistent. There have been five transfers that were associated with a non-party buying permanent production rights to become an exhibit for party. And this allows them to carry over transfer water. These entities were all non-parties and intervened to become exhibit for parties. Um, so that they could um, buy and carry over transfer water. The other transfers that have occurred, um, the transferees have all been a party to the judgment, and they've either been an Exhibit 3 or an Exhibit 4 party, a new production party, or a non-stipulating party. And only Exhibits 3 and 4 parties can carry over water. Um, the new production and non-stipulating parties can get transfers um, for replacement water assessments and for production in that year, but they cannot carry over unused water. That's um, the first question um, that the advisor can be asked. Are there any questions on um, that one? Did I answer that correctly? Let, let me just comment on uh, this first transfer um it's the the world of transfers depends uh, somewhat on what the status of the parties are that are involved in the transfer and what the transferred water is going to be used for whether it's going to be uh, used for investment purposes versus to fulfill a replacement water obligation so you, you have to take those into consideration. You, you can't just say, oh, it's a transfer, therefore we apply one rule to it. In the case of White, uh, White Farms, White Farms uh, Mutual Water Company, um, they are a non-stipulating party, and we're asking them to intervene in the uh, case to have their status changed because as a non-stipulating party under the judgment, they're not entitled to carry over or transfer. So we've put the onus on them. They've agreed to make that application to the court to have their status reinterpreted 
Um, I, I don't have a position on whether it's going to happen or not. We'll wait to see their papers and give everyone an opportunity to weigh in uh, with objections or comments in the court proceeding on the motion to intervene. But that, that's why the resolution approving the Van Dam to White Fence Farms uh, has the conditions in it that it does. It's because of the unique status of White Fence Farms as a non-stipulating party, um, which is a, is different than than the other cases of the transfers that we're going to be talking about. I just wanted you to know that we we've, we've looked at this and um, the onus is on the transferee White Fence Farms to get its status changed so that it can be subject to taking carryover water. And how would that be different from somebody who's buying water for a develop for for investment? It, it isn't. They they are taking the water for investment purposes. Mm -hmm. No, I thought you were trying to make a distinction between somebody buying water for a replacement water and somebody buying water to just hold on to it for future use or... Yes, yes, there is, I'm sorry, there, there is specific authorization in the rules and regulations that we've adopted recently in 13C, subsection 7, <laughs> that allows a party, even an, a, um, a stipulating party or a small pumper, the language is clear. If, if the transfer is solely for the purpose of meeting a replacement water obligation, it can be approved on that basis, um, even a non-stipulating party. Uh, but here, White Fence Farms is not, the purpose is not to pay off replacement water obligations, so it's not applicable to it. Mm. But that rule and regulation is is applicable to, uh, I think, to the next transfer, talking about the one to Mettler Valley. Um, it all depends on what the status of the transferee and transferor are and what the nature of the use is going to be as to what sections apply to it. Okay. Long-winded long way of saying that the resolution builds in those conditions and uh, doesn't recognize the the uh, transfer to uh, White Fence Farms until those conditions are met. Greg, this is John Eukestead. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, White Fence Farms is a stipulating party. White Fence Farms 3 is not a stipulating oh, I'm party. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. I, I, I remember that there is, it's White Fence Farms Mutual Water Company number three that's at issue. Yes. Okay. Right. This is Kate again. Um, if we're kind of done with that, I can go on to the next question that the advisory committee um, had. And that is... Um, Specifically, is the water for the Griffin Family Bypass Trust remaining with the land? If the water is not transferred with the land, then do the two trustees who are not Exhibit 4 parties need to buy one acre foot of Exhibit 4 rights? And I just want to clarify that the Griffin Family Bypass Trust is an Exhibit 4 party, and they're just splitting up their production rights. And the rights will stay with the land, um, which as indicated on their transfer applications. Since this is a split of rights, each party is... And on that, before you leave that, Kate, for the board's interest, I think this was has been addressed before as a success or an interest issue under 3.5.27 of the judgment. Um, the original owners are deceased. It passed by through a trust. The property and water rights were divided between the two surviving sisters that are now transferees. And uh, that that's the analysis we brought to it. Anyway, just wanted you to know that. Thanks, Craig. And the last question the vice we had was um, Mettler Valor Mutual uh, Water Company is not an exhibit for party. 
they are defaulted party and will remain and will obtain a transfer of carryover from an Exhibit 4 party. Is Metler required or did they purchase one acre foot of permanent production rights for this transfer? And Metler Valley Mutual Water Company um, is now a new production party since they were granted 116 acre feet of new production in January of this year. And the transfer that they're requesting on today's agenda is for their 2016 to 2020 replacement water obligations. And all the transferred water will be used for the replacement water and none of it will be carried over. Um, since as a new production party, they can't carry it. So unless there are any questions on that, I'll just jump into the transfers. And again, again ju just to comment, um, Mittler Valley is a defaulted party. And uh, I, I think the rules and regulations apply to its transfer for purposes again specifically to to pay off the replacement water obligation uh, that's the analysis for for this transfer and if i could interrupt this is matt um i think we should vote on each resolution as they're presented just so we're not voting on all of them at, at once i good agree idea. good very good idea matt so, Kathy, if we could uh, go back sure. to uh, item number 12A. Okay, so with that discussion, do I have a motion? Okay. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. I need so, to pay attention. So, Kath Catherine, will you go on with the um, transfer information? Sure. Keep up, Matt. So uh, the first transfer starts on page 45 of the packet, and we've seen this before. It was continued from last month's meeting, and Craig and Martha Van Dam would like to transfer one acre feet per year of permanent production rights and 1,000 acre feet of carryover water to White Fence Farms Mutual Water Company number three. Um, Craig and Martha Van Dam are exhibit four parties and have the production rights and carryover water for this transfer. White Fence Farms Mutual Water Company number three is a non-stipulating supporting landover party with four acre feet per year production rights. And they would like to purchase the one acre foot per year production rights to become an exhibit four party and to be able to carry over the transferred 1,000 acre feet of carryover water from the fan dams. Um, this, this transfer is for investment purposes and no extraction point has been identified, so no material injury analysis can be conducted at this time. And the, um, as Craig mentioned earlier, the application was continued from last month to allow the Council for White Fence Farms Mutual Water Company Number 3 to prepare a motion to get court's approval of their request to become a stipulating party. Uh, Todd Grador recommends the approval of this application on the condition that White Fence Farms Mutual Water Company Number 3 successfully establishes with the court their status as a stipulating party and that a new point of extraction application or subsequent transfer application is submitted in the future before water is produced and is shown not to cause a material injury. The advisory committee um, chose not to vote on approval of this application. Okay. Is there any uh, questions or discussion on this? Yeah, Kate, did I hear you saying that they have four acre feet of groundwater rights? Um, they do, and that's groundwater rights associated with a non-stipulating party. So they have the right to produce that amount. Mm -hmm. And legally speaking, Craig, how when they for this one acre foot that they are purchasing from the Van Dance family, and they're going to go and file whatever they need to file with court to become stipulated party. Yeah, that that that's really the unique situation there. <clears throat> they are White Fence Farms number three. Uh, is a non-stipulating party to the judgment 
and as as in that status under the judgment they are not eligible to receive a transfer of production rights so they've got to intervene and establish with the court uh, their status as a stipulating party we rendered no comment or opinion about whether that's feasible or not in light of how the judgment defines a stipulating party and a non-stipulating party um, but one thing is clear from the judgment non-stipulating parties can't receive a transfer so that's their predicament to work out and give everyone uh, who has questions about it and the advisory committee obviously did opportunity to weigh in when they filed their motion to intervene so the purchase of one acre foot uh, is what it, what entitles them to um, intervene and become a stipulated party? They can intervene. Uh, they need to intervene in order to change their status. They do, they do not need to buy the one acre foot. No, that, that, that's not required for them to intervene to change their status. They, they, they have the ability to, to intervene based upon the fact that they are currently a non-stipulating party seeking a transfer, and they therefore need to have the court um, assess their status, give them an exception to the rule, or somehow change their status under the judgment to a stipulating party. Got it. So the purchase of the one acre foot has nothing to do with this? I don't think it does. Okay. I don't know why they're buying one acre foot, of, but that's beside the point. Okay. Madam, Madam Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, this, is, this is John Glendry. I, I may be out of radio contact. I would like to probably at this point... I will stay online, but I'd like to turn it over to Adrian at this time because I, I would hate to drop out and miss something. Okay. Adrian, would you be would Adrian be prepared to step in at this point? Yes, I am. All right. With your permission, uh, Madam Chairman, I'd uh, step down off the off the at this point. The time. Yes. Yes, that Thank is you. okay, Thank and you. Adrian will take over for you. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other questions, do I have a motion to approve Resolution 2128? Mr. Director Chisholm, I'll so move to approve uh, Resolution 21-28. Do I have a second? Adrian Mrs. Derrick, I'll second it. Okay. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, we will have a voice vote. And I took that as Director Chisholm and a second by Rekka. I heard Adrian first, so, okay. So we have a roll call vote. Uh, Director Areki, Areki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Rekka? Yes. Director Urasi? Yes. And Director McLaren? Yes. With that, that motion passes, and we will have Catherine go to Resolution 2129 with the transfer application. <coughs> Thank you. The next transfer starts on page 69 of the packet. The Meritorina Trust would like to do a one-time transfer of 348.74 acre-feet of carryover water to the Mettler Valley Mutual Water Company. The Meritorina Trust is an Exhibit 4 party in the West Antelope sub-area, and they have the carryover water for this transfer. Mettler Valley Mutual Water Company is also in the West Antelope sub-area, as shown on Figure 1 on page 70 of the packet. Mettler Valley Mutual Water Company is a defaulted party, but their new production application for 116 acre feet per year was approved in January 2021. This transfer will fulfill their 2016 to 2020 replacement water obligations for past production. Their new production application, which is included in the packet on page 80, 
found that the potential for material injury by Mettler, um, Mettler's production as defined by the judgment, judgment is negligible. And this is a one-time transfer to offset replacement water obligations for pumping that has already occurred. Todd Groundwater finds the potential for material injury associated with this transfer to be negligible and recommend approval. And the advisory committee also recommended approval of this application. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Hearing no questions, do I have a motion on resolution 2129? Yes. Oh, yeah. I thought uh, Mittler is also asking for uh, a waiver of a late fee. Where is that? Next item. Oh, the next item? Okay. So it's a separate item. Yeah, that's okay. item number 13 on the agenda. All right. Okay, then I move that we approve re resolution 2129. This is Adam. Second. Okay, I have a first and a second. Do I have any public comment on this item? Okay. And Harry Mann, but I do hear somebody needs to mute, please. Okay, can we go to a roll call vote, please? Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Rekha? Yes. Director Urasik? Yes. And Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. We will go on to resolution 2130. And that is a transfer. Um, that transfer is associated with a split of production rights and carryover water, the Griffin Family Bypass Trust. And it starts on page 125 of the packet. The Griffin Family Bypass Trust is an exhibit for a party with a permanent production right of 668 acre feet per year. They would like to divide the production rights evenly. 334 acre feet per year would go to Marlene Griffin, and 334 acre feet per year would go to Diane and James Nye. And ramp down and carryover water will also be split evenly. We find the application to be complete, and the split of rights will not result in a change of um, extraction locations or amounts. And consequently, um, we find the potential for material injury as defined in the judgment to be negligible. The advisory committee recommended approval of this application as well. And are there any questions on it? Okay, there's no questions. Do I hear a motion for resolution 21? I, I have a quick question for Craig. When that happens, when when a, a, a party splits these waters, does the second party get added to the exhibit four? It should be. I don't know that it happens that way, though, Director Ariki. Uh, it it does by operation of law. This is a successor in interest under three point five point two seven of the judgment, but I I don't know that that's being tracked, and maybe it is. Maybe Kate can uh, can respond to that. Yes, I definitely um, show it on um, our water accounting tables and the date that the split occurred. I see. Does the court need to approve the addition and the deletion from these exhibits? Uh, no. Okay. So long we're tracking them because, you know, 10 years from today, yeah. somebody yeah. finds something that we don't know. Yeah. Good point. I'm glad to have Kate confirm that that's being done. All right. Thank you. Okay, I have no other questions. Do I have a motion? I'll move approval of um, uh, resolution R21-30. This is yeah, Adam. I'll second. Okay. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Rekha? Yes. Director Urasik? Yes. Director McLaren? Yes. 
That motion passes, and we will go to our last transfer application with the resolution of Resolution 2131. So the fourth transfer application starts on page 191 of the packet. Landry Farms is an Exhibit 4 party and would like to transfer 30 acre feet per year of permanent production rights to the Antelope Valley Water Trust. Landry Farms currently has the production rights to transfer and um, the Antelope Valley Water Trust is also an Exhibit 4 party and has 20 acre feet per year of permanent production rights at this point. The transfer is being bought as an investment to be sold at a later date, and no material injury analysis can be conducted at this time because the extraction location is unknown. We recommend approval of this transfer on the condition that a new point of extraction application or a subsequent transfer application is submitted in the future before the water is produced and that future water use is shown to not cause material injury. The advisory committee also recommended approval of this application. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions on it? The, the only thing, Kate, is what if this water get pumped from an existing well? Would how would we would you be able to track it if they report the production or something? Well, I think when they would submit their annual production report, right? Um, that that number would be compared to how much water. Um, they have approved um, without. Um, a point it's, of kind of, uh, it's kind of tracked separately. I have a separate table that shows water that's just an investment table. And so okay. when we get these annual production reports, we would check those tables and just make sure they're not over pumping what they can't over pump. Right. And at this point, and the Antelope Valley Water Trust can't pump anything. Okay. And the party would have to report. That yes. amount as a carry yes. over anyway, right? Right. Okay. So long it gets tracked because you know these things they just get out of hand one here and one there and before we know it, just too many of them. Right. right. Yeah, things get more complicated. Right. Welcome. Any more questions? All right. And we have no more questions. Do I have a motion? or approval from Resolution 2131. Adam, here I move that we approve Resolution 2131, um, 2031. And Adrian Reckle, second. Okay, I have a first and a second. Do I have any public comment on this item? Okay, may we have a roll call vote, please. Director Reck. I'm sorry, excuse me, Director Ricky? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Recca? Yes. Director Urasi? Yes. Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. And we will go on to number 13, consideration of possible action re request to waive the late charges. And our administrator will. Yep, discuss this. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, good morning, this is Matt. So in your packet on page 202 is a letter submitted by Mettler Valley Mutual Water Company. And as you know, you, uh, the board just approved a transfer uh, to satisfy Mettler's past due replacement water assessment. Um, they are seeking uh, relief on roughly 11000 $818 in late fees or delinquent fees uh, that was assessed for the past due balance on their replacement water assessment. So in the letter, it kind of lays out the, the timeline. I just want to note that uh, Mettler has been cooperative with the water master in pursuing a, a replace, uh, transfer to satisfy the replacement water assessment. They have paid up on all past due administrative assessments. And uh, we discussed this at the ad administrative committee with directors Ariki and Rossick earlier this week. And um, there were some ideas thrown around, but uh, I think we could just start up, start it with open discussion amongst the board. Okay, Director Rossick. 
I, you, this is Adam. I mean, I'll tell you what we discussed. Uh, there was, while the amount of money is not a lot, and, and I do appreciate uh, Mr. Lawrence is getting uh, the water, uh, the replacement water uh, for the for 2019, I forget another exact end date. But nonetheless, I think, uh, you know, we don't want to be setting uh, any precedents. Uh, we want to make sure that we treat uh, all default parties uh, um, equally. And uh, some smart person proposed that we do maybe a, a payment plan for them uh, in recognition of uh, their sincere effort, you know, for the replacement water. Uh, and I'm, I'm good with that. So I'll leave, leave it up to the board how uh, you want to do that. If it's two-year or three-year period, uh, I suggest that we do it over a two-year period. Uh, if there is a need to extend it to three years, I don't have any problem with that. Anyone else have any thoughts on this? Okay. Yeah, this is Director Chisholm. I would support uh, um, a, um, a payment plan, um, and then maybe we could have uh, staff work up something uh, with them with regards to that and bring it back uh, with the specifics so that we'd have more. Uh, information to be able to do that if, if that's something they, they choose to do. But I, I agree with uh, Adam that we got to be careful um, to make sure that we treat everybody the same. Adrian, this is Director, thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, this is Director Recca, and I 100% I agree with all the comments that have been said. I guess we're I kind of lean towards the letter that um, Paul Mendoza, the president of their Metler Water Group, has um, issued. And since 2020, they've been diligently trying to get this resolved. I, I realize that um, late fees and everything in the world, not this is 100% not COVID-related, uh, but everybody has struggled um, no matter what. And given what they have done to assess their, um, their water members, and they were classified as a severely dis disadvantaged financial community at the time getting the grants. Um, I would just throw out the suggestion that since they've shown that they've been diligently working since December of 2020, if the December 2020 and 21s could be waived and the fact that they are one who's finally getting off of the delinquent assessments and trying, um, I'd like to see something done. A payment plan is perfect, but I would just suggest that, um, and I'm, and I'm sorry that the late fees only go through 2020. So that, that would be considered. Yeah, this is Derek. I'll, I'll chime in. I, I, I do think that, you know, Adam and I as we discussed, you know, we talked about an administrative meeting and I, I do support that uh, payment plan. I don't feel like, um, we should be waiving any fees. Um, and if they started at the, I think Adrian, you said at December of 2020, so the end of the year in 2020, and they're up through 2020. Um, I think the fees, the delinquent fees are, um, represent the. Uh... Okay. So can we um, make a motion um, to deny the request to waive the late charges at this time? Yes. So I have a motion. Should, should I make and just a point of clarification to, to council and staff is should we table this um, and come back with a recommendation of a payment plan and just approve it at that one time versus doing this or do we need to do well, this step? I, I think we have we have an action in front of us. It needs to be denied and then uh, instruct staff to come up with a payment plan of the next board meeting. My, my recommendation would be to table it and bring it back yeah. all in one item. I don't think we have to take action if we table it. Um, okay. Right. If we don't, we don't. That's what we did. So is everyone fine with that? I have... Yes. Everyone else is 
fine with yes. um, tabling it. And we've withdrawn the motion to deny it for the time being. Is that right? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. We will go on to item number 14, which is consideration and possible action on small pumper qualifying applications. Resolution 2132. That's going to be Angel Fit. Fitzpatrick to cover the side. Okay, so this month we have one small pumper application. Uh, this application starts on page 209 of your agenda packet. Um, this small pumper is located in the central antelope sub area and the water will be used for domestic use. Uh, the well was drilled in 2009 to supply water to a proposed house and the house was never built. The applicant has purchased the property um, in 2020, and he will use the existing well for a future house, trees, and possible animals on the property. Um, does anybody have any questions on this small pumper qualifying application? Okay, hearing no questions, may I have a motion on resolution 2132? I'll move on uh, resolution 21-32. Second, Adam. Okay. And is there any public comment on this item? Okay, having no public comment, <coughs> may we have a roll call vote, please? Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Reka? Yes. Director Urasik? Yes. And Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. We will go on to item number 15, consideration and possible action on non-production monitoring well applications. It will be resolution 2133. Kathy, I'll take this one also. Okay. Uh, we have one monitoring well application on this one's agenda. Uh, it starts on page 235 of your agenda packet. This production, I'm sorry, monitoring well application is for waste management. Um, they plan to replace an existing monitoring well located on their site um, to allow grading in that area. Uh, the replacement monitoring well will be on the same parcel as the existing. Um, does anybody have any questions on this application? Okay. Hearing no questions. What are they monitoring for, do you know? Just out of curiosity. Uh, you know, let me see here. They are a landfill, so I'm sure they're monitoring. Landfill. I yeah. see. Okay. So physically, where is it located? I know you said it, but I didn't catch it. Can you say that one more time, Adam? Where, where, where is this monitoring level will be located? I move we approve resolution 2133. This is Adam. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment on this item? May I have a roll call vote, please? Uh, I, may I, Madam Chair, one, one more. Now, who, who permits these wells? Is it the county health? Mm. Yeah, it's LA County Environmental Health. Okay, so they will give us the drilling permit and all that stuff. Uh, the applicant is responsible for that, but yes, they, they are required to give us the, the okay. well permit. Th thank you so much. Appreciate You're it. welcome. No, it just, I, I didn't know how that goes. All right, great. Director so, Ricky? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Calandry? Oh, I'm sorry, Director Reka. Yes. <laughs> no word. <laughs> Director Urasik? Yes. And Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. We will go on to item number 16, which is consideration and possible action. Watermaster's engineer, engineer budget, amendment number six with Todd Groundwater. 
All right. Uh, good morning again. This is Matt. So on page 255 is the proposed amendment number six. Uh, this covers the calendar years 2022 through 2024 to extend the contract with Todd Groundwater. As you know, they've uh, done a great job for the water master from, since day one. And um, earlier this year, we reached staff work with Todd on developing a scope of work and a budget, um, which you can see attached to the amendment. Began on page four, 256. And uh, the cost per year is roughly 222000 to $224,000 in 2024. So um, this has been presented to both the board and the advisory committee in prior months. And today we are recommending a formal approval of the amendment number six. Hearing no questions, do I have a motion to approve the Water Mouth Engineer budget amendment number six with Todd Groundwater? And this is for five years, right? Five years. No, three years. Three. 2022 through 2024. Okay. Yeah, I, I move that we approve the amendment. Um, I, I, uh, number six to Todd uh, Groundwater. Uh, I don't have any, any comments on that. Do I have a Yeah, second? this is Derek. Derek will second it. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment? May I have a roll call vote, please? Director Ricky? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Areca? Yes. Director Jurassic? Yes. And Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. And we will go to item number 17 consideration and possible action on 2022 administrative budget and administrative assessment for calendar year 2022 and our administrator will speak on this all right thank you this is matt again so on page 267 is the proposed budget or administrative budget for calendar year 2022 uh, this budget is based on uh, keeping the assessments at five dollars per acre feet acre foot a um, couple highlights in the budget uh, very similar to prior years on the, the revenue side. Uh, but we you'll note in the projected column for 2021, we did acknowledge the recovered legal fees and the interest on outstanding assessments collected by uh, Phelan Pending Hills. Uh, we're showing that in the column of 2021 uh, since that was when it was collected. But just to note, we are keeping that those funds in the money market account for now until the appeal is complete. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Also on the, the USGS, you can see on the revenue, we're acknowledging uh, continuing with the 50% funding through the Animal Valley State Water Contractors Association and 25% funding through the Antelope Valley Irwin Group. So that makes that that's shown as thirty six thousand for the association and eighteen thousand for the Irwin group, and then corresponding on the expense side for the USGS, we are showing the total program cost of seventy two thousand. So whatever is not collected through the association and Irwin, uh, the remaining twenty five percent will be paid for by the water master. Um, we also are, are showing uh, the cost for the Todd groundwater amendment just approved by the board at uh, $222,600 for calendar year 2022. And then at, at the very bottom, you can see our rate stabilization fund. If everything lines up as uh, 
budgeted for for next year, we will end the the calendar year of with about four hundred forty thousand in our rate stabilization fund. So overall, we're we're in pretty good shape. We've made great progress financially over the last couple of years with uh, trying to stabilize cash flow and and operating within a balanced budget. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. The only thing I would say is we need to try to find uh, ways to either reduce the cost further. For example, we should try to automate automate as much of the data uh, as possible, either using databases or whatever the case may be. Uh, but to the extent that we can use technology to reduce cost and reduce duplication of effort, that would be really great. Okay. Do I have any more questions or comments? If not, can I have a motion on resolution 2134? Mr. Wayne, I'll, I'll uh, uh, make a motion to approve resolution R21-34. Adam, your second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing no public comment, may I have a roll call vote, please? Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Reka? Yes. Director Yurosik? Yes. Director McLaren? Yes. That motion passes. And we will go on to number 18, which is the administrator's report. All right, just a couple of things to update the board on this morning. Uh, as you know, in, in past years, due to the holidays and where our typical meetings fall for the month for the Watermaster Board meeting, we'd like to uh, follow that same practice and combine the November, December board meetings into one special meeting. So we are proposing uh, December 8th, which is the second Wednesday in December, as the proposed date for that special meeting. So hopefully every, that works for the board. If it doesn't, if we could uh, hear from you, that'd be great. Hearing none, sounds like we are going to set December 8th as our special meeting. Um, and then the second item, uh, something the AVAC board has been discussing about developing a, a long-term uh, administrative and staffing plan for the Watermaster and to start transitioning uh, some of the AVAC staff out of the current role serving as administrator. So there is interest from the AVAC board and myself to try transition myself out of the role of administrator for the water master. So they, the AVAC board does recognize that um, AVAC staff has a lot of knowledge of the operation of the water master. So we realize that this is gonna take time and, and we're currently developing a plan for that transition. But if uh, any of the board members or other parties have ideas on what that transition looks like, uh, we're open to that. So just wanted to give the board a heads up on what we're starting to discuss within AVAC. I've also reported that to both the advisory committee as well as the administrative committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments before we go on? I, I do wanna get a feel of um, from Peter. Peter, you're still on the phone uh, on Palm Del Water District and, and your thought on that. Uh, does Palm Del Water District wants to continue? Or because I think that would kind of dictate uh, our strategy, the board strategy that is, on, on how to go forward. Thank you, Adam. Yes, I, I'm still here. Um, Palmdale has a similar view that uh, AVEC does. Um, okay. We haven't formalized it, but it it is my intent also to um, 
step back on my role with Watermaster um, in the in the upcoming year, if possible. Yes. No, I you know we we've been grateful for both agencies to have helped with this. Uh, and I think Matt, you, you did say uh, on Monday that uh, staff from AVEC, other than you, would continue at their current role, or they also want to back off. Uh, aside from the transition period, yeah, we need to see what that looks like. But uh, AVEC recognizes that that we may play some role with the administration. We don't, we're not quite what, sure what that looks like but we recognize that we may have to help out at some capacity. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, I, I get it. I have to think about how we're going to do this. I mean, one of the options, and I'm talking to the board here, one of the options is for us to see if we can hire and, and you know, the, labor market is so tight, I'm not even sure we can find somebody <laughs> to, 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 do, to do the administration for the water master for us. Um, but we'll, I think we need, the board needs to create some sort of a, maybe the administrative committee, maybe uh, Derek and I can kick around some ideas uh, on how, uh, how we're going to approach this. Uh, and uh, discuss it at a later time, maybe the December board meeting or something. I mean, I have some ideas. I don't know how well they will work. Uh, you know, AVEC and Palmdale have not been really charging us a lot of money. So I don't know if we can really find somebody to do the work for the same amount of money. So we need to understand that that would be not the case. Uh, I don't know. Any thoughts? from other board members? Yeah, this is Derek. I, you know, I, I would express that if, you know, we need a clear picture. And uh, first of all, as Adam said, truly appreciate the efforts, the time, and, <laughs> and the economic commitment that, you know, both of Palmdale and ABEC have made to the Watermaster. But I think for us to really make a good decision not just a midterm decision of you know to see the long-term plan of involvement by both of the districts um, with us so you know we're not you know all of a sudden dealing with matt's departure and peter's but you know if, if it's you know the entire staff on that then we come up with a, a midterm or short-term midterm and long-term plan that we can deal with and know how to establish um, I think it was made noted at the admin meeting that you know there's a ton of um, just tribal knowledge that um, has been created by staffing that we need to make sure we, we can transfer um, as cleanly and as thoroughly as possible so that, that's important that, to me and I think you know, Adam as you said that you know, if, if the board's comfortable with it, we can start working on that process, but I, I would go back to staff to say, let's understand your, you know, coming from your boards, let's understand your full, you know, plan, uh, you know, going into this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the appropriate step is uh, AVAC staff and Palmdale staff need to clearly um, relay to the board, to the Watermaster board, what our intentions are what our timing is for getting out and what our our proposal is for making that transition. So I don't know whether you'd have it by next meeting, but you plan to Yeah, we're going to continue a, to talk about it and update and, the board. And so that yeah. would be like a future agenda item. Yeah, on. we'll try to have some, some framework for the next meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we could discuss it further to the uh, next administration, administration committee, or even a special meeting if you need to, Matt. Uh, yeah. If, if you're ready, I don't have any problem. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Derek wouldn't have any problem maybe just talking about this particular issue and, and brainstorming ideas on how we're going to go about it. Uh, that way we're in a position to discuss with the board in the next meeting uh, the options that we will have. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yep. 
Sounds good. And I just wanted to uh, say thank you for the opportunity. It's been fun. Thank you. Well, thanks, yes. All right, and if we have no other comments, then we shall go to the Watermaster's Engineer Report. Are you there, Kate? She's yep, probably I'm here now. I was muted. <laughs> um, I can take this and um, on page 270 of the packet. There's a summary of the amounts of approved new production and qualified small pumpers. And this is the same table that was in last month's packet because there were no new production or small pumper applications um, approved in September. And that's all we have. Unless there are any questions. Looks good. Any questions? Okay, hearing none, we will go to item number 20, our general counsel's report. Yes, most of this is going to be a subject of the closed session. Uh, what I can report in an open session is motions have been filed with respect to Tapia and Zermalza. Uh, they're in, included in your board packet. And uh, the hearing date was originally set for October 28, uh, due to counsel for the, those parties having conflicts with that date. We agreed to revise it to have the hearing uh, November 12th. Um, and the update on Phelan and the appeal is that the matter is fully brief now. And when we got inquiry from the Court of Appeal for the 5th Appellate District, um, indicating that oral argument's going to be set in December of this year. So it's really pretty rapidly, we should get to a determination on that. Um, so that's, that's really all I have to report again. I'll be, have a, a lot to say in closed session on the uh, two existing matters. Okay, any questions or comments? All right, we will go on to number 21, which is board members request for future agenda items. I think we have plenty. <laughs> okay, then we shall go to closed session conference with legal counsel. Do I have a motion to go to closed session? I move that we go into closed session. Do we have to log off and on or? No, no, we will okay. move you, we'll move you over. Okay. Just I'll second. Here. Okay, I have a first and a second. Do I have any public comment? All right, may I have the roll call please? Director Ariki? Yes. Director Chisholm? Yes. Director Calandri? Director Urosic? Urosic? Yes. Director McLaren? Yes. Okay, we will go Can I ask to Kate real, real quick. Kate, right. um, Arden on, is Arden on the line? Um, Arden, are you on the on line right now? I don't know. Okay, I was just wondering for Yeah, questions. maybe she had to get off to do attend to something else. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Director Calandre. I'm we have you going into closed session. Okay, we have you, um, John, going into closed session with us. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.